without uh, any current, and he's currently uh, uh, in an act of disturbing self-sacrifice, dean of the uh, China Center for Economic uh, Research. Uh, and uh, really, I, 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 uh, I'm looking forward to the talk. Just thank you for taking the time, because I know that the position is uh, is what it's time consuming. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for this uh, nice introduction, and also thank uh, Professor Heckman uh, to take uh, really, really, really hard efforts uh, to organize uh, uh, this conference and also uh, the summer school. Uh, we are really proud uh, to be part of uh, this efforts uh, to contribute to organize uh, this uh, conference and also uh, summer school. Uh, this is some school I believe will be a very good success and will set a standard of economic uh, research and the teaching in China. Um, so I was asked to uh, speak on inequality. Uh, I think uh, uh, I am uh, not a bit more qualified to talk about the inequality uh, than most of you say in this room. Uh, but let me uh, give it a try. This is kind of uh, a kind of, uh, a worst start of uh, a project that I, that I uh, really want to work on, that is uh, how to uh, link uh, inequality and middle income travel. Um, this is uh, only because China has reached this stage and uh, have been a lot of talks inside China, uh, whether China will be trapped. And if you read the recent, uh, recent news in China, you're going to see many people believe that if China's uh, uh, economic growth rates are going to reach kind of a new normal, uh, which means it's going, many people uh, say it's going to be around 6% or even less than 6%. Uh, so that's going to be much lower than those uh, high performing uh, economies uh, in their high growth period of time. So that really rings a bell uh, for China. Uh, but first, uh, let me uh, show you this graph. I think uh, many of you have uh, seen similar graphs. Um, see, so let me show you that uh, the middle income trap uh, is real, right? uh, not just uh, uh, some kind of a carrot talk. So it, here, this is uh, uh, the income in 1960, uh, kicking uh, as uh, relative to US level, so percentage of US level, then taking log. And that's uh, the income level uh, in 2010. Okay. It is kind of income transition. Okay. And this is 45.9. Uh, the, it, you can see there are a group of countries uh, that are kind of trapped and in poverty. Uh, they have never accepted poverty. But surprisingly, this uh, group has a small number. Right? The number is actually relatively small. Uh, the, most of the countries are in this uh, category, right? They, they, in the 1960s, uh, they reached the middle income, uh, but then there is a huge divergence in this group of uh, countries. Uh, so this is kind of a so-called middle income trap. Many of them actually uh, have a decline relative to the United States. Uh, this is actually the majority, right? Majority of the countries is just a decline relative to the United States. Some of them uh, uh, have some growth, uh, but still main, uh, remain in a middle income range. Uh, uh, by the way, when we de uh, define a middle income, it's actually between 8% of uh, American per capita income and 48%. Okay, that's, that's a large range. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, other people also yeah. use this. Uh, the group uh, of uh, economies uh, that escaped uh, this uh, middle income trap uh, of a very small number. Uh, and so we can name some of them. Uh, those are East Asia economies, uh, some in, uh, in South uh, Europe and uh, Middle East. Okay. So you, you can count them, uh, about a dozen of them. So if you think about the middle income trap, it's, uh, it, it's a real. Okay. Uh, the question is that when we think about the inequality, because many people believe inequality plays a role in it, uh, but the, the, I think that the challenge for us is that 
uh, even some of those countries have been to show data uh, started the ways of we're unequal society, but uh, they could escape this poverty trap, but they just cannot escape this middle income trap. Right? So that, that's the challenge, I think, uh, for us, if we, we really want to link uh, inequality uh, with uh, uh, middle income trap. Okay. Did, uh, this uh, compares China with uh, three other uh, countries. Uh, this is China, this is Brazil, uh, Korea and Japan, and then I normalize uh, uh, the, this uh, horizontal axis by uh, the number of years since uh, uh, the economy took off. So China reached the same income level as Brazil did uh, in almost exactly 30 years after the economy took off. Right? But then the, the question is, uh, where China uh, look like uh, Brazil, or maybe not exactly like uh, Brazil, but uh, something like this. Okay, uh, all of China look uh, more or less uh, like uh, Korea and Japan. By the way, when Korea and Japan reach uh, China's per capita income today, they continue to grow really, really fast, more than nine percent uh, in the next uh, ten years. Right. So that's why I say if uh, China's growth rate uh, is lower. Uh, below 6%, that's uh, quite a contrast uh, with those uh, high-performing economies. Okay. The, uh, I, I think uh, Scott already showed you uh, this uh, uh, table. Uh, see, those uh, uh, economies that have performed much better or escaped the middle income trap are all those uh, equal societies, especially like uh, Korea and Taiwan, right? So I think look at the income inequality, uh, they are just uh, one or two uh, magnitude uh, uh, degree lower than other countries. And if you look at the landed distribution, it's the same, right? So uh, that may they say something. Yeah. Then, uh, Together uh, with that, if we compare education, and uh, this is really what I want to say, uh, in what I think uh, everyone really want to explain why in what affects uh, the current growth in the middle uh, range, probably one of the most important channels is through the spread of education. Right? So here, uh, uh, my student is prepared this exercise. This, uh, uh, the red the lines are for those high performing economies, those uh, the economies that have exact uh, middle income income, and those are those middle income countries uh, staying in middle income. So this is by calendar year, this is uh, uh, by the, the number of years since they enter the middle income range. Right? So you can see a persistent difference, especially on this one, a persistent difference of it. Right? Uh, this is the uh, average schooling year. This is a secondary schooling year. Uh, the, the gap actually becomes a larger uh, farther when they enter you kind know, of later stage. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my students also did some preliminary regression and they just found that a secondary education is actually more important than this uh, average schooling year in the whole society. So it seems that uh, the secondary education it, it is more important than kind of uh, uh, general education for, for everyone. Um, so then this is uh, uh, just a, uh, uh, one slide that explains basically my idea. Um, uh, this actually comes from a Jun uh, study. Uh, I just <laughs> for your study. Uh, 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 you find out uh, <laughs> another cause, I think, right? You yeah. found out uh, uh, the return to education shows this A-shape, right? Uh, See, so if you just have, like, uh, uh, say, elementary education, uh, the return uh, increase, but not very dramatically. Uh, but uh, in the secondary uh, stage, like uh, special high school, right? Uh, this can be quite dramatic. I think the, from their study, the return to education is about 10% uh, per year. Right? And, and also uh, university education, college education. 
you know, uh, after college education, the growth of um, uh, this return is leveled out again. Okay. okay. Uh, so, because of this S curve, you can, you know, if you want to write a, a kind of a theoretical model, you can generate the, it's kind of a, a multiple equilibrium of them, right? That's because there is kind of an increasing return to education in this range, right? Uh, so when you, uh, when you are really poor, right, you can afford education for a small group of people who can have, say, college education, okay? Uh, so that may sustain your economic growth right, in the initially, but uh, when you enter the middle income, uh, you want to have more people to have kind of more education. Uh, then, if it, your country is very unequal, then this process is blocked. Right? It's not that easy to spread education uh, to ordinary people. Okay. So then uh, you stop a growth, right? And, and also in this uh, stage, uh, I, I think the two, uh, uh, two things are very important. One is R&D, that way it's gonna have an improvement of uh, general education. And those two things are uh, uh, connected uh, with each other. Uh, even if you have R&D, uh, but you do not have uh, qualified workers, you're not gonna, going to finish the, the, the work. Then I think this is the challenge you're facing China. Right? So uh, this is from uh, COPS, uh, uh, the China Family Panel Studies, uh, that was done by our university, This is for 2010. Um, so the, the dark bars are for cities, uh, light bars are for the countryside. Right? Uh, and so then we, it's gonna make a period, right? So you can see the improvement of education, that's true, right? There has been uh, quite improvements uh, in the population, uh, where it is, okay? But the problem is that, uh, especially the countryside, on average, right, uh, people only get uh, seven years education, right? uh, less than uh, middle school graduate. Right, uh, seven years. Right, the middle school requires nine years. Uh, two years is short. And nine years is the government's goal for uh, compulsory education. So even in this youngest group of people, we cannot meet uh, the government goal. But if you look at the official data, they're going to tell you almost 100 percent of people have nine year education. Right, two year uh, are actually quite a lot. Okay, you look at the improvements, the two years are quite a lot, okay. So I think, I think uh, this, is, this is the problem, right? Uh, although China each year produces seven million university graduates, the vast majority of the labor force uh, still has uh, very, very low education. But on the other hand, uh, you look at the, the wage rates. Uh, this is just uh, from one case study uh, from a construction site in Chongqing at the end of uh, 2012, I look at their salaries. Right? Actually, the, the, the median <coughs> is between like uh, 3,000 to 5,000. The, their salaries are not very low. Okay? As a matter of fact, uh, one-fifth of them have a wage over 5,000 a year. So that is uh, about the 1,000 US dollars. Right? So the salaries are quite high. But if you look at their education, uh, you know, there are forty percent of them have education less than elementary. Okay, then middle middle school about uh, uh, half. Okay, so uh, the high school only eight point five percent. Look at this. Uh, you worry about uh, whether they can meet the government's goal to double their income by twenty twenty two. That's the government goal right? to double uh, income by. Uh, on the uh, 2010 days by uh, 2010. Okay. Uh, that means that they have to have to earn a salary of what a thousand dollars on average uh, in like a, a seven or eight years time. I, I think it's going to be very very difficult uh, by the current education. Uh, uh, 
even in uh, Baxter Cone, uh, this is kind of most uh, labor intensive company, right? they have begun to use machineries to substitute for workers, because workers have become so expensive and it's so uh, unscaled. Right? Uh, recently, there is a news that Baxter Cone uh, has to pay like uh, uh, at least millions or even uh, uh, billions uh, uh, in cost to redo their uh, jobs uh, for Apple. Right? That's because of human error. Right? So that's why they're using uh, machinery. Right? This is also from uh, uh, Scott's uh, project, because my son works for him, so my son talks a lot about <laughs> his project. Uh, I, I think uh, that China is kind of, uh, especially those uh, uh, rural kids, uh, rural families, are uh, being defeated by the current uh, success. The income is growing so fast, uh, wage rates are growing so fast, so those uh, uh, rural families uh, do not want to invest into their children's education. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, I say that uh, uh, this is a little bit different from Scott. I think uh, uh, Scott worry a lot about the formal education. Uh, I, uh, there is a uh, issue over there, but uh, the government already has a grand uh, uh, plan for uh, improving uh, formal education, actually from kindergarten to high school to university. The government has a whole set of plans for that. And since the government is increasing uh, spending on formal uh, education, but the problem is that it's those uh, migrant workers, right? Uh, 160 million or even more than that, uh, even in 20 years time, they are still going to be the majority uh, with labor force uh, in China. Uh, so, but uh, no one is taking care of them. Right? Think about uh, vocational training. The government invests uh, very, very little, especially the central government. That's not uh, spent much money on that. Uh, think about that if, it, if the central government can spare uh, 30 to 50 billion yuan each year, <coughs> That's actually a tiny number for the central government. I right, think about uh, this corruption uh, woman, uh, the, the, together with uh, the minister of uh, railway. Uh, she got, she has got in the like, last ten years. She got uh, three billion, three billion in kickback, three billion. So you think about the, the vast investment into uh, highway, uh, no railway, right? So if we can just uh, spare a fraction have the investment uh, into railway and uh, put the money into people. Uh, China will become much better uh, China because education has all those long lasting effects uh, on human beings. And uh, uh, that's also linked uh, to uh, China's uh, sustainable economic growth in the long run. Uh, not to mention, it also improves the uh, life quality of those migrant workers themselves. Okay. I, I will just uh, stop here. Uh, thank you. Yeah. So I, I'll start with uh, so the money, right? You're talking about you want to get the money out of the uh, Department of uh, Railways. That's not, the uh, Ministry of Railways, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, one possibility actually regarding, related to the uh, Scott, uh, morning Scott uh, uh, presentation was the money actually, uh, there's a talk and there's real possibility of uh, getting a larger share of the state-owned enterprise profits. So right now, only 5% of the state-owned enterprise profits out of 2 trillion, more than 2 trillion RMB, were uh, they are ten, they are turned uh, into the central government, and uh, you know that's a larger share, and we can do that. And I've been talking with uh, even their executives; they don't they don't have a strong hold of that of that money. They actually, if you you know, there are arguments uh, uh, against getting that money, but they but if you come, you know, there are two arguments they made. The picker just. Uh, one argument is they have uh, lots of burdens because of the reform. <coughs> uh, older employees, retiring employees, another one is uh, they want to be in international competition. So they want to use the money to participate in international competition.
this, those four arguments are easily, uh, you can easily convince them that the, so, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting a little bit of that, that's going to, it's a real possibility and I think we can convince the government uh, to do that. Uh. Yeah, may, many people say you know we, we should ask the uh, SOEs to, to turn more yeah. uh, uh, profits to, to the central government. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, uh, one possibility. Another possibility is just uh, um, a law. Th there is a surcharge called Zhao Yu Fu Jia Fei, you know, the education surcharge, uh, 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 charged uh, together with tax. Uh, now only the, the cities can do that. The countryside, like a county, cannot do that. So probably we can allow, you know, counties uh, to do that, or the, uh, at least allow those more advanced province uh, to increase uh, this surcharge. Uh, so every company pays. But ultimately, that's going to benefit the companies, and then you spend money to finance a vocational training. Uh, asking SOEs uh, would be very, very difficult. Oh, I don't think so. Right. I really <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I think I'll ask your question. Um, what's, uh, you've emphasized this notion of the middle income trap, Scott, which uh, presupposes a certain commonality <laughs> across the country. What facets of China do you think uh, differentiate from the <laughs> members of this group. Um, and, and this is, I mean, it's a serious question because the cross country <laughs> growth literature collectively has failed to identify uh, salient determinants, even though we hear talk about institutions or ethnic heterogeneity or, uh, you know, uh, a host of other, uh, other assertions. And so I, I want to put it on the table that. I think that the, uh, the issues of uniqueness should uh, warrant important considerations. Yeah, uh, we always say happy families uh, are all the same. Yeah. <laughs> Our happy families uh, uh, of many forms. They did look at the data. Those economies that have escaped the uh, uh, middle income trap have a commonality. Very distinctive commonalities. Equality. Uh, much higher education, uh, much higher share of uh, manufacturing, and the lower share of the primary goods exports. Uh, they may rely on export, but not the primary goods exports. And also, uh, their life expectancy is much higher. Uh, uh, and uh, I think that there is uh, also not, uh, another one. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, dependent ratio is much lower. Right, so, so you look at the, all the economy, you're going to find that they're quite the same. But then if you look at those countries uh, that have been trapped, uh, you can find all sorts of stories, like Latin American countries might be because uh, of uh, the sovereign debt crisis. Uh, Middle East, uh, you can find other stories. Uh, uh, Africa, you can find other stories. Um, I, I, I think uh, it will I want to just name one risk for China. Uh, definitely that's the inequality. Because if you look at the other indicators, China have very similar indicators, scores, with those uh, successful economies. Except, that's the only exception, that's the inequality. Inequality is much, much higher in mainland China than the rest of the successful economies. Yeah, the yeah, first question is that you mentioned that now that the wages of the migrants work increase enormously, that uh, need the tool to the job of of the civilian. Right. from middle school, yeah, something like that. This is a very peaceful, short-term phenomenon, or the long-term phenomenon. You 
say if we look at from a long-term perspective, that means uh, because the high value of mother's work is the uh, enterprise will substitute type of uh, labor, that will be increase is the value of the skill. That will be is increasing in play, the education. So in long term perhaps that is not a phenomenon we should worry about. Well, they, uh, I, I'm not sure if that's a long-term or short-term, but even if it's a short-term phenomenon, that's going to have long-term consequences. Because you produce those uh, underqualified uh, workers right, in millions, and in the long run, you're going to feel uh, the, the, the impact. Right? E even for this short period of time, you're going to create uh, a lot of uh, people. Uh, I agree with you that the government should put a lot of money uh, on the uh, Chinese program of migrant work. Uh, but uh, actually, the Chinese government already has some program. Program is not so successful, you say. Like some Chinese program, some like not successful. So that means, uh, you say, for this migrant work, uh, you cannot give them more education opportunities. Only you can do that is a training program. Right. You say for this training program, migrants will have no incentive to participate. So uh, sometimes it's uh, so difficult for government to do something. Well, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Scott knows, Mr. Rector, they, they are doing all, all those intervention <laughs> programs. But I still believe if the government can spend a little more money, uh, then uh, you know, people's incentive will be uh, a risk. Uh, I have been, I have visited one, at least for one factory. In that factory, there is a, a light uh, school over there. And those uh, young people go to that light school. And supposedly they work for one day, in you know, a whole day, and we're tired, but there's still, uh, you've got people who are willing to go to that night school. And they need to pay a little bit of money. But then if the government can subsidize more, Right, uh, that's going to increase uh, the incentive for more people to go to that kind of uh, schools. And also, don't forget about the culture. You know, this uh, what was it called uh, in English? Uh, uh, higher vocational schools. So, so after this uh, school, you are going to get a university college diploma. But basically, you're still working. And many people want to get this diploma. But uh, the central, as I, as far as I know, the central government does not pay any money into a culture system. <coughs> Local governments are paying, okay? And, and the private uh, companies are doing that. Uh, if uh, the central government uh, can put more money into those uh, uh, colleges uh, uh, to give, uh, for example, almost a free education to them, uh, you're going to attract a lot of students. I just have a question, like, like a comparison when you compare mainland China with Taiwan and then with South Korea. Because when I visited, I forgot my high school uh, geography, how big Taiwan is uh, bigger than Hainan. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, also like uh, South Korea, I, I just think like maybe half of the Heijingjiang province. I mean, a lot of heterogeneity. You know, when you talk about China as a genie, and then compare with these, and then they are so homogeneous, and then they have a relatively lower. Right. Definitely, I am hate inequality. I'm just right. saying in terms of comparison. Right. Okay. Uh, first, as I said, if you compare mainland China with uh, uh, the rest of those successful economies, you find a broader similarity, except the inequality. Yeah. That, that's why. Because yeah, so that but, but, but even if you look at the say the province, mm -hmm. most of the provinces have really high Gini coefficient. The highest I think is uh, more than sixty percent. The lowest is or it's also uh, I think beyond the forty percent. Right, so the lowest rate is even higher than in Taiwan or Korea. Right, so so yeah, of course you can also talk about the say. Uh, a district uh, in Beijing, right? Yeah. But I suppose that even in Haidian district, the inequality is very, very high. Okay. Uh, 
<laughs> my, my second question is, you see this uh, doubling yeah. <laughs> in migrant workers uh, by 2020 is very hard. We know that doubling, that means uh, at least 7% of a per capita income. Right. Now we gross GDP is uh, hided to maybe 6% or something, it is. But how that number comes from government put uh, as a commitment, as a goal? Do they have worry about it? What happened? They failed. They do some consultation. Any <laughs> just outside the country. Uh, I, I, I thought the, the, the government's goal is very conservative. <laughs> At least uh, exactly. when, when they announced it uh, last year, it was a very conservative goal. Right, seven percent per annum. Uh, that's uh, not uh, a very difficult task for China. But of course, if this uh, slowing down continues, then it's going to become quite hard, right? Uh, so that, that's the trend. trend. Yeah. Okay. Right. And last question is for you. Um, I'm a little bit worried. I, I'm not sure if you're an expert. I, I've just read about it, and so I worry about putting a lot of eggs into adult education basket. So that. Should we spend a lot of our money in adult education, or should we reallocate that to education of children? Um, in that there's just lots and lots of incentives that keep adults, or barriers that keep adults out of education programs. Um, uh, how do you, I mean, if you're having trouble uh, meeting other financial programs, do you think the rate of return is high for adult education as other types of education? I think my, my worry is that most of those kids, even kids in the countryside, after they got the, those education, they're not going to become workers anymore. Right? So I, my worry is that China will have a faster deindustrialization in 10 years' time. Uh, that's not going to work for China. Right? So China will still be a low-income country, comparatively speaking, in 10 years' time. Okay, but if uh, at that time no one is going to, to to be willing to become a worker, uh, that's going to be a real danger for China. So uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, you know the return to adult education is higher than return to children, but that's the danger. We are going to have no workers in the future, and also in this uh, ten years time, uh, their education level is uh, so low. And if you really want to increase uh, your technological level, uh, you're not going to do that. Right? For, for example, our university, our university actually has invented a chip. Not uh, this high performing chip, but uh, at least a secondary, very high speed. The problem uh, in China, we cannot make it. Right? The, the, uh, you know, we do not have qualified workers, qualified machinery uh, to produce this chip. Uh, in a kind of a mass scale, that's the that's the problem. I, I don't think that China uh, lacks uh, innovation. Many people say China does not have enough uh, innovation. I, I don't think so. so. China does not have enough qualified workers. But, but how much of this can be solved by sort of incorporating engaging the private sector a bit more instead of providing and in other words, providing. Uh, Private set, you know, you know not profit, for profit <coughs> vocational training schools, for example. Maybe providing more entry into the education sector. And we were talking earlier today about integrating school to work into a apprenticeship program or something like that. It seems to me that be a lot of role. My understanding is that you know, private actors have been sort of kept out of the training. Right. And that's a vital area of many countries of providing those kind of media components. Yeah, as a matter of fact, most of those vocational training is provided by private providers in China too. But they be, you, you visit their schools, uh, they cannot teach those really technical stuff. It's just, you know, they, no, but I think integrating with the new technology introduced training workers in that technology. That's more like a term oriented type of vocation. Oh, a firm level, firm level is where it's hard. So, uh, if they train the workers, then those workers uh, will go to another company. No, no, depends on how specific you that's an, that's an argument for partial support, not in general. 
maybe a lot of specificity in the teaching. Like you need that job, like making the chip. But if you train the cohort of workers to make that chip, they're not going to migrate too easily from selling donuts or doing something. Yeah, but, but the, you see in China, if you, uh, Xiaohua has more knowledge. And this is where those uh, factories are, you know, form clusters, right. right? So they are quite similar. If you train, then the next door will come and say, hey, go to my uh, factory, I'm going to pay that. It's organized at a slightly higher level in the, the consortium. Right, exactly. So you think like an industrial park, right? So I understand. Yeah, that, that's not right. the aircraft you might have engineers going across, but it would still be the case. They would be cool. Yeah. And so you're making it, yeah, exactly. You're making it slightly higher yeah, the, level. The, I, I fully agree, but I, I still think that the government should do something, yeah. at least to organize the consortium. I put some seed money in, and then, you know, to just uh, uh, make this happening. Otherwise, uh, you know, those companies. Uh, no one wants to be the first guy to start this. Because everyone is worried about losing money. So if the government can put some, you know, organize this, put some money, then that may start. Well, let me uh, thank Professor Young for the